All right, if everybody could uh, take their seats. You can tell who the real hardcore TPI people are, the people in the room right now. Uh, my name is David Gross, and I have the honor of moderating uh, what should be an extraordinarily uh, interesting uh, panel. It's entitled, Who's in Charge of the Internet? The role of international institutions, I will tell you my prejudice, which is hopefully international institutions are not in control of the internet, uh, but we will find out more. Uh, we have a great, great panel. I will not go through their bios, both because that would be all we would do this morning, uh, but also because the bios are in the materials that you all have. Uh, the way we're going to handle this is uh, each of our uh, panelists are going to give a short, four, approximately four-minute presentation. Uh, then we'll have uh, questions for each one as we go through it. Then we'll have a conversation. And we certainly hope to have uh, uh, questions uh, from, uh, from you all in the audience. So first up to bat is FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly. Well, thank you, David. Much appreciated. Thanks to TPI for having me. I, um, my, I won't take my full four minutes because, I, one, I have a summer cold. Uh, very fun. And then, two, I um, woke in the middle of the night. My hotel neighbors were quite loud. Uh, if that was you next to me, and I'm not appreciative of that fact. You certainly enjoyed your hotel room uh, more than I did mine. Uh, so I'm going to pres also preserve some more time for questions. If you believe in the benefits of the, in, in the past uh, conversations we had in the previous panels, then this topic that we're going to approach today is so very critical. One of the, for good or bad, depending on your viewpoint, the role of the FCC is actually quite limited, but it provides a great platform for me to examine the issues and talk freely uh, on the subject matter. When I look at the question as it's posed, I, 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 I'm going to interpret the word controls as operates or some function of operation uh, because there's many different ways that can, can control can, can occur. And I want to, I guess I, when I look at this issue, I kind of separate it into two parts. One is kind of what's happening today and who's overseeing the internet today. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, most people would argue it's a combination of entities. It is the private sector, it is the public organizations. It's what people refer to you know, collectively as the multi-stakeholder entities. Um, it is you know, having some component to that is the ICANN functionality there. And then you have the role of traditional governments, which are very active, not necessarily in the United States, but, in other, but worldwide, they are quite uh, engaged. I mean, look at you know, how involved Russia is, how involved China is. Uh, you can name the country in a more de desperate situation and you'll see that they're engaged. So, and part of that discussion gets to the ICANN transition that we went through in the last couple of years. Uh, I've, similar to, to, to David's point, have deep concerns about international organizations being involved in internet control or, or, or operations. And I think that the, inter the ICANN transition raises a bunch of different points that were brought out at the time and are still going to play out for years to come because I worry that the structure that was set up cannot be preserved. Uh, and I also worry uh, that the, the countries that have entities involved in ICANN are, are basically being run by governments themselves and are de facto governments uh, today. The second part, uh, as I said, that was the first part. The second part is the international organizations and what does the future look like, in my viewpoint. And, and you think of the other entities that, that, that have tried to get involved in some capacity or would like to get involved. And these are different forms from the United Nations to the ITU to a number. Of, and you're starting to see this conversation into the standard setting bodies where you, know, you have private sector standing setting bodies and they do wonderful work. Um, and and then the, you're starting to see the machination of what does that mean for future control of the internet? And then what does it mean for governments being involved in internet, in internet standard setting bodies going forward? And you're seeing governments involving itself in a greater control. And so I'll leave with two points. Uh, one is that, and it's the theme that I've been talking about in a number of different international forums and also domestically um, to, to both collectively uh, to, my, to my friends in the new administration, but also um, to anyone who will listen, I, I say, is that if the United States is to be involved uh, 
uh, in the different international organizations that have that would seek to have a role in internet control in some capacity or have tried to delve in this, if we are going to be involved in those organizations, which I think it is important, for instance, the ITU, I think there are benefits to being part of the ITU for spectrum harmonization in a number of different fronts, then we must change our approach and our involvement as it currently stands because I don't think we're uh, taking advantage uh, of our rightful role given whether it be our contributions, whether it be uh, our, our, our viewpoints on the internet, it be it our private sector companies that are engaged in the internet being a protection of American citizens going forward. So I think we have to change our overall approach. And the second point I, I'd leave with is that if you um, believe as I do, and I think that David's point was that, that international organizations are troubling uh, being involved in, in controlling the internet, then the trend line is, is negative. Uh, you're going to only see more involvement from international organizations, more involvement from government going forward, um, and that is harmful, in my opinion, for the future of the internet and the internet experience for Americans. So I'll leave it at that and preserve some time for, for questions. Well, if I could uh, follow up one question, uh, sure. Commissioner, if I could. Uh, and you talk about a need for a change in the overall approach with international organizations like the ITU. Um, recognizing that the ITU is dominated by uh, governments, it is an intergovernmental organization, is there an opportunity for the United States through our government to be able to advocate for uh, our collective vision of the way in which the internet should be run, that is with private sector leadership, uh, with uh, freedom to innovate, uh, to provide services, and the importance of free flow of information. Is there an ability to uh, effectively advocate in that space? Well, I think, I think we're at that, that, that moment for the new administration to decide that, that question. I think it can be done, but it, it means a, a change of approach. So we are not members of the, we're not in the leadership, you know, with, with some minor technicalities. We're not a, a great part of the leadership of the ITU today. Um, and we haven't been for, for quite a while. And so I think that if you, you know, believe that we should be and we should be in this organization and there are benefits to be had, then we should be in part of the organization, we should be part of its management, we should be making some of the decisions at the highest level and not relying on other countries to uh, fill those slots. We haven't, we decided, you know, as you're well aware, we decided um, in, in the last couple go-arounds not to put up uh, U.S. candidates for roles uh, and didn't back a number of uh, other countries that may be more allied to us uh, for, for various reasons, more, more geopolitical uh, than I'd like to admit. And I think that's problematic. And so I think you have to change the approach. And I think that this is the moment for this, this administration to decide. I'm not part of the administration, but I think that they have to make some of those critical decisions. You know, do we play a more active role or not? And what do we do given our resources and funding that we do to, you know, do we contribute today? Do we change that up to expect a better outcome? Very good. Commissioner Broadbent. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'm a commissioner at the International Trade Commission, not the, federal, the FCC or the FTC. And my, our focus more is on trade barriers. Um, my sense here is that uh, we may want to do some more consideration of what international organizations are how they're impacting uh, trade and the internet. Um, at this point, we have real no, no real framework or institutional uh, policy sense of how trade is conducted on the internet. For many, many years, we've had strong rules of the road for trade in goods, which has served the United States very well, basic principles of non-discrimination, national treatment. In terms of the internet, global trade, digital products, there really are no real trade rules of the road right now, except for uh, disciplines that the U.S. is starting to achieve in some of the free trade agreement negotiations. And I, so I would say that those are important international institutions as, as we look to uh, defining goals for the future uh, on uh, moderating some of the practices that can happen on the internet that can disadvantage uh, U.S. exporters. Uh, as we are having no active, internet, in, active negotiations in the WTO, um, the, the FTAs have been useful, and, and I think we look to the NAFTA negotiations as the template for uh, what will be uh, important to, to achieve in the future. Um, Ambassador Lighthizer had indicated in July his negotiating objectives for those reopened, uh, that reopened uh, agreement. 
and he's talking about pro prohibiting restrictions on cross-border data flows, reinforcing IPR protections and enforcement, uh, denying, uh, defining ISP third-party liability in terms of permitting fair use of copyrighted material, uh, prohibiting, require, uh, prohibiting requirements on technology transfer, and several other strong disciplines that um, I would argue uh, will be helpful to, to U.S. industry. Um, the, the ITC uh, is doing a report on overall trade barriers uh, that was requested by USTR, and it will stand as a, a basis for uh, formula, formulating policies to reduce trade barriers. Um, we are going to uh, provide analysis on localization requirements, market access limitations, inconsistent data and pri pri privacy protection laws, IPR infringement, um, cop uh, particularly in, of copyrighted material, ISP intermedi intermediary liability, censorship, and bur burdensome customs requirements. Um, I think the, the important thing to say is a lot of these barriers have gotten worse in the last five years, uh, and that's troubling uh, since the U.S. companies are, uh, tend to be market leaders uh, in the U.S. and globally. Um, I think Nigel Corey at the Information Technology Industry Association has observed that one of the largest trade barriers not being addressed in multilateral institutions are localization requirements, um, which has, have really doubled in the last five years, uh, and they've, they've identified 80 cases worldwide. Uh, the problem that we have facing us politically is that the G20 and WTO members can't really agree on restricting them, so that's keeping it out of a WTO discussion. Um, and on, on these points, the United States really is at loggerheads with Germany and France and China. Uh, so we are at an impasse. Uh, but I think uh, it will be interesting to see what the U.S. can achieve in the NAFTA negotiations and uh, whether uh, awareness of these barriers get to be uh, more concerning to U.S. companies as they try to uh, take the success that they've gained in the U.S. market and push it forward internationally. Well, thank you. Let me, let me ask, as I could, a, a bit of a follow-up. How effective do you think trade remedies can be going forward to opening up markets globally for U.S. interests, and vice versa, making sure that the U.S. market uh, maintains its openness? You mentioned that, for example, in the NAFTA negotiations that are going on, there is a provision in there now. It did not have anything about digital trade, if I understand correctly, but they're talking about doing it now. Uh, is this going to be an effective way, or is this just more uh, papering over a problem that will persist? Well, I mean, I think in trade agreements, um, oftentimes the, the biggest benefit is it gives you uh, a framework to go discuss a problem with your trading partner and come to a resolution before you have to resort to whatever sanction might be down the road. And sometimes you have more leverage if there's uh, you know, more of a sanction involved. And we'll have to see you know, what the specifics are, the provisions that they can ag get agreed. But I think the fact that we're silent on a lot of these problems, which are uh, really replicating fairly fast against US industry, is worrisome. And we do have to think about how effective these provisions can be. So I can't answer your question on how, how effective they'll be in the future. Uh, but I think it's important uh, that we think through how best to take up our concerns with, with other governments uh, when we are being cut out for, for discriminatory reasons. You mentioned about the uh, trade barriers report that you all will be issuing. When will that come out? Uh, next month, September. Okay. Available on Amazon.com, I right. assume. Hmm. Very exciting. Right. So we have had uh, two distinguished government representatives. Uh, we're now going to have uh, a representative from academia. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador Grossing. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a professor and also the faculty director of the Internet Governance Lab at American University, so I'm another DC person, and it's really nice to be out of the humidity, I have to say. Um, if you think about Internet governance as the coordination and the administration of the technologies that are necessary to keep the Internet operational, and then the enactment of policy around that, then you have to admit that the internet is already governed. But a very important point is that there's not one single system. There are many different functions ranging from um, the coordination of critical internet resources like domain names. We sometimes think about that in the ICANN role as all of internet governance, but it's really just one small part. There's also, um, you know, putting my engineers, I'm trained as an engineer, putting my engineer's hat on for a minute. 
There are the things that you can't see at all, like uh, the technical standards and who is responsible for setting those, the interconnection agreements between private companies. There's the role of uh, information intermediaries that has been discussed already at this conference in establishing uh, technical policy, not just the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, but uh, domain name system, registries and registrars, and uh, even uh, companies that are not in the tech sector. Um, you know, and many other other issues. So I would say the the, the first point is that um, the backdrop for this is that we have uh, not a single system, and we have many different actors ranging from international organizations, the private sector, sometimes civil society, and uh, certainly these new institutions like ICANN. So I think in order to um, contribute with this in mind, I'd like to throw out three quick points about the state of internet governance. The first, and um, Ambassador Gross I, and I recently wrote a paper together on this along with Gordon Goldstein. Um, and the, the first point is that we really do have competing visions. We can't say right now that we have the multi-stakeholder model of governance. There are competing visions for how the internet is governed. And um, these can be divided into um, one that does envision a private sector-led multi-stakeholder model that wants basically the free flow of information. And this is the model that is um, prioritized by the US and by Europe and other entities. And then on the other hand, we have um, this, competing, this competing vision of state-controlled cyber sovereignty models of running the internet. This is the one that's favored by China, by Russia, and some other countries that are interested in greater control uh, of the internet. So these are not just discussions. They are actually policy visions that have very real um, implications for free speech, for global innovation policy, and for foreign policy. Uh, a second point is that and uh, you know, I, I'm drawing now from a, one of my recent books, but it's that infrastructure, technical infrastructure, serves as a proxy for political power. And this is definitely the case in the internet governance space. So the politicization of technology has been with us for a very long time, obviously, and in all kinds of technologies, certainly with the internet, whether it's Egypt cutting off access to the internet, or the kind of censorship that takes place in China. This has happened for a long time. But there's an increasing trend not only of co-opting, of using infrastructure, but of trying to tamper with it. And this has been hinted at already with the discussion of data localization. So this, this, is, um, this is an area, where, whether it's local redirection of the domain name system queries, or interest by governments in weakening encryption, or attempts to impose interconnection regulation on the private sector, or these data lo localization requirements that are um, establishing and, 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 and uh, regulating how private companies store their data. This is uh, tampering with the infrastructure of the internet. And uh, many times policies around this are just um, practically incompatible with how the engineering works. So you know, we could speak all day about that. But the final point I'd like to make in this discussion of international institutions is to recognize and acknowledge the privatization of governance. So the basic thesis of all of my work is how arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. And we can't view what gover governments do in this space as political and then say what private companies do is neutral. So it's important to acknowledge that. Um, the, the internet is made up of technologies owned and operated by private companies. They enact public policies in many different ways through their terms of service. Um, you know, we've already heard a number of people discuss the role of domain name registrars in um, taking down and blocking access to white supremacist sites, so I would say that is an example of that. And we have to reflexively examine um, privatized governance as well as the traditional uh, sovereign governance or the role of institutions like ICANN. So we have the technical mediation of the public sphere. We have, in many cases, the privatization of the conditions of civil liberties within that sphere. We have these very real ideological clashes between the private sector-led system of multi-stakeholder governance that has worked very well and cyber sovereignty models. And then we have this increasing recognition 
of infrastructure as a proxy for political power. So I think it's very appropriate that we're having this panel on internet governance here, and I'm very happy to be participating in it. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you. And, and let me just uh, sort of connect. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly talked about uh, uh, the, the rise of uh, nation states trying to control these things. You mentioned that as well. As you see this, and I think everyone would see this as an increasing problem um, in terms of innovation and the like, what's to be done? Is this a debate we have in international organizations? Is this a debate you have within industry? How do you bridge this and where do you go with this discussion? Right, well, the, it, it's important to, to say that the, the, a balance of powers, I think, is the best case scenario here, right? So it, if you look at the way governments have um, intervened in the internet, it hasn't always been positive, right? It's important to acknowledge that. Like we have censorship in China, we have um, trying to uh, tamper with interconnection regulations, we have um, the way Russia cracks down on dissidents through what they do. We have surveillance in the United States. You know, like, so, so having the power tip that way, I think, is not good, especially in the area of data localization, where it just doesn't map what the technology, uh, how the technology works. So with that backdrop, I would say that having um, more of um, an, engineer, an engineering understanding of how the technologies actually work um, would be part of the solution, where even in an area like encryption or in an area like data localization, if you understand that even a, um, an exchange of information within a single country between two network operators that may be down the street from each other can sometimes go to another country's internet exchange point and then come back. You can have customer service locations all around the world. You can register your domain name in another part of the world. So I think that um, exposing that kind of infrastructure that is beneath the level of content and even beneath some of these discussions around ICANN and trademark, things that are beneath content, I think that exposing that, bringing it into the international fora, um, having people from the Internet Engineering Task Force come in and increasingly even civil society experts, that that might be some uh, help. I, I am concerned about this um, cyber sovereignty model. It's a very real model in some ways in parts of the world. The China model is working. So the, um, the tipping states, the states that are in between, I think that that's another area of intervention going to um, the Brazils of the world, the Indias of the world, and other kinds of uh, states. Very good. Now we have uh, the first of our two private sector representatives on the panel. Uh, Will, you, you work for Google, a company that has men been mentioned once or twice uh, over the past day or so, and seems to be in the crosshairs of a lot of these issues. Where are we going? Hopefully out of the crosshair. But, um, <laughs> uh, so thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be here, particularly with uh, a group of such uh, esteemed folks. Um, and while I'm excited to be here, I'm perhaps not as excited as your uh, wall mate, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. So um, still, still glad to be here. And for us, this is a question that comes up a lot, uh, the sort of who's in charge of the internet? What's the role of international ins institutions? Um, which essentially boils down to how do you answer the question when someone comes to you and says, I'm from the UN and I'm here to help, uh, when it comes to internet policy? And it, you know, I find that the best way to approach that question and related questions is to uh, sort of address the fundamental question, which is, is the way we got here the way we want to continue to go? Because uh, that's really what we're talking about here. Um, you know, the internet didn't become, you know, this force for social and economic opportunity around the world because some regulation said we should do it, or there was some uh, General Assembly resolution saying, you know, you must do this. Uh, it happened because governments and international institutions largely played enabling roles, uh, whether it was through efficient spectrum allocation, protecting cross-border data flows and the like, while uh, entrepreneurs, ac academics, activists, frankly, people in basements uh, put their heads together and innovated, figured out a way uh, to make something out of this. And so, you know, if we think about that's how we got here, innovators innovating, governments enabling that innovation, uh, 
Uh, the question is whether we want to continue to use that model or whether we want to uh, do something different, uh, whether we want governments to be able to control and regulate internet platforms, internet services, how traffic goes over the internet, that, so, that sort of thing. And as uh, uh, Professor Denardis just mentioned and others have alluded to, uh, that's not, that's anywhere from a settled question. Um, there are governments out there uh, that are seeking to control the way that the internet is managed at a technical level, to regulate what content is permissible on the internet itself. And in our view, though those governments are simply wrong. Uh, that that's not the way to continue to uh, bring the internet to more people and have more people benefit from everything that it has to offer. Um, at the same point, we've talked some about international institutions like the ITU. The reality is that they're not gonna go away, right? Uh, these institutions are here and in large part, uh, and in important ways, we want the institutions to continue to be there, right? If, if, if the ITU wasn't there uh, working on spectrum allocation around the world, we would have to create an organization to perform that function, right? It's, it's an important thing that happens. The question is, do we want it to do more? Do we want it to change what it's doing? Do we want it to get into questions of internet policy and internet services? And so, um, you know, in our view, these efforts are not only uh, wrong and counterproductive, they detract from the important work that these institutions are already doing. Uh, and that the more we focus on unhelpful things, things that they have not historically done, things that have not been uh, condition precedent to the internet's explosive growth over the past 20 years, the less they are doing of this other really important work on which the internet relies. So for us, uh, you know, international institutions have a role to play, but just not in the way that I think many are arguing these mm -hmm. days. So rather than go on, I'd rather just chat. Okay, very good. Well, let me ask you to, uh, to comment a little bit on what uh, Commissioner O'Reilly said in terms of uh, the damage that these institutions can do uh, because of the role of governments using them. You see that, I think, virtually every day. Yeah. Uh, the same question I asked Laura, what's to be done? Well, I mean, I think, again, you don't change people's minds or the course by, by not engaging with them. So I think it's important that um, companies and civil society and activists and governments uh, continue to play a role and show up and fight for fight the good fight, fight for what's right. Um, at the same point, um, you know, we need to be uh, cognizant of things we can do to reduce our reduce our risk, reduce our exposure to these kinds of things happening. Uh, we we can talk more about it later, but this was one of the reasons that for the IANA transition, for instance, uh, we were supportive of the transition because we saw it as a way to. Uh, protect the way that the internet was uh, presently managed into the future given some changes that were going on. So for us, uh, you know, there, there, there are some out there that argue that um, some of these institutions are lost and it's, it's better to just not engage. I think that moving forward, that's, that's neither a realistic nor a productive strategy. And we've got to figure out strategically what we want to accomplish in the work to meet those goals. Very good. Wolfgang, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you on this panel for many reasons, one of which is this is an international panel and you're the only one without a U.S. passport. <laughs> so I really appreciate your being here. Wolfgang? Well, thanks, David, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, really good conference, um, which I very much enjoy. Um, much has been already said on, on the role of international institutions. What I particularly liked was, uh, were the comments of uh, Commissioner O'Reilly on the ITU, because I think um, the, <clears throat> the Western states have left uh, in the past year the ITU um, as a playground to, to China and Russia. And I would very much um, <clears throat> encourage US involvement. Um, being maybe only containment, but uh, uh, a bigger role could be also <laughs> helpful because uh, as, uh, as Will just said, I mean, we cannot abolish this institution. It's extremely important. Uh, we are mobile and provider all over the world, also in the US, as you might know. 
Um, and uh, frequency allocation is one of the biggest things also for the future of the internet. Um, so this uh, organization plays a role. And I think uh, um, European states and the US have to redefine its position of and how to deal with that. And of course, uh, it's dangerous uh, um, to see what they plan in terms of internet governance. So I fully subscribe to what Professor Denadis just said. I mean, the, the success of the privatization of governance uh, should be upheld in, in when it comes to running the internet. Um, there's one issue where we look at um, with some sorrow and um, where we think the future of the internet could be endangered. Um, if you look at the future of the internet in terms of internet of things, security is the most important thing to let that happen. And if you look at cybersecurity, um, there's no role for international institutions yet. And um, there is, um, I'm not all, um, saying we need an international institution, um, but what we need there, um, if you look at the, the last incidents, um, cyber attacks, uh, WannaCry and all these viruses, um, what we need is international cooperation, at least among um, states which have the same um, view on the internet, and I'm back to OECD maybe, um, or some of the G20 states. And this is the reason why we as a company very much uh, promoted uh, the idea um, of having some mechanism of exchange uh, when it comes to cybersecurity incidents. Um, there's a larger um, group. Um, I mean, there was a colleague uh, after the last virus uh, attack from Microsoft uh, asking for a Geneva Convention on cybersecurity. Um, I think I'm, I'm fairly realistic that, especially in this country, Geneva Conventions under the auspices of the United Nations are not <laughs> the most uh, favorite first step um, to, to resolve such questions. But um, I think we need a kind of um, um, exchange process uh, where we look at what happens throughout the world with cyber incidents. Because that's, uh, in our view, damaging the, the real international internet because um, states tend to resolve the issue on their own. And then you, you end up with localization and, and all sorts of uh, rules which, uh, which hinder the free trade in the end and uh, the internet as we know it. Very good. Let me pick up on, you, you raised a number of very important points. Let me pick up a, a briefly the point about uh, Europe, the G20, the United States, and others uh, similarly situated working together. Uh, as some people may know, but probably most people don't know, um, there is discussions at the ITU about holding another wicket. That's the uh, a conference, an international conference for the establishment of a new treaty or revising uh, the existing treaties that would, in theory, give the uh, ITU uh, explicit jurisdiction and control over certain aspects of the internet. Uh, this was uh, a, a major conference in 2012, um, and Europe and the United States and a total of 54 countries uh, fought against that together. Uh, and although 80-some uh, countries did agree, uh, it had created such uncertainty that it really, as a practical matter, hasn't gone forward. I assume you, what you're talking about, uh, Wolfgang, is trying to put together the, uh, put the band back together again uh, <laughs> to get uh, those countries uh, of like minds to, to work together on these issues in sort of an informal, ad hoc type of approach. Exactly. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. And how would you see that coming about? Is that something where the EU and the United States can work together and create some of this? Or I think um, if you look at the, the, the um, cybersecurity orders on both sides of the Atlantic, the, the um, thinking is rather similar. And um, they could be the nucleus for, for such a discussion. I mean. Um, I don't think a multilateral conference or whatever could resolve such issues 
at the beginning. Um, we also thought about um, OECD and G20 because there we get some of the, the major others <laughs> um, involved. And um, I think um, it's, a, it's a longer process. Um, I compare this to disarmament um, um, processes in the 60s and 70s. In the beginning, nobody really spoke about rules or goals. Uh, it was about building trust and, and, and talking uh, uh, what could be a goal then, and then you come to rules. Yeah? Um, so um, that might be an approach. Very good. Commissioner Roy, if I could put you a bit on the spot here, since I like to put people on the spot if I could. Sure. Um, you know, in terms of international leadership, the U.S. obviously played probably the predominant role in the early days of the Internet in terms of the way in which it was organized, the sorts of things that uh, Professor Denardis uh, talked about uh, and the like. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that that leadership has probably waned a bit over the past couple of years. Uh, what role do you see the FCC and uh, the U.S. government writ large in trying to uh, establish or reestablish sort of thought leadership in terms of the international discussion on these areas? So I, I think I take your, your, when you say the U.S., I think we, we, we acknowledge that it was private sector companies that were the foundation of the internet and its development and, and ex expectation and expansion in the early days and certainly through the middle days until we get to today. Uh, so uh, the private sector less than the government, government certainly having some policies along the way through, through, the, through the Clinton administration, a number of different policies carried forward through the Bush administration. So policies existed, but generally it was the private sector that carried forth the, the, the amazing growth that we, we saw uh, through, through the internet expansion. And so going forward, um, I, I think that you, you, see, you say you know, a, lot, uh, a need to redevelop some of the, the, the thought processes or policies um, overall, and I think that that's, that's critical. Now, I'm not sure that that's going to be a function of the FCC itself. Um, it will be a consulting role in that, that equation, but it is, I think it's incredibly critical for this administration as they stand up the different, the different um, oversight responsibilities that... Um, whether at state or at commerce or wherever, um, to have these functions, be it in national security as well, that, that it be incredibly engaged in this topic matter. I think that the last administration somewhat, um, you know, for a number of different reasons, took a back seat on some of these matters and have left us kind of where we are. And we need to make a, a critical decision, in my opinion, and that's why I kind of framed it as, you know, are we going to go forward in an, an aggressive, active role that some of my colleagues talked about, or are we going to back away? Now, the ITU, I think, is also at a, at a, at a very, you know, at one of those uh, turning points, right? We at the FCC have been able to um, allocate spectrum for high band purposes, millimeter wave, and move forward, notwithstanding the failure of uh, WARC 15. And I was there at WARC 15, and it was, you know, very troubling trying to talk to international um, negotiators about additional spectrum in, in some of the bands that we were working on, in addition to 600 megahertz. They were not cooperative, they, they were uh, behind the times. And so we move forward anyway, and our spectrum frontiers, uh, you know, the, the, I, I give credit to Tom Wheeler for moving forward, uh, and we were uni unified in moving forward without the ITU, and without all the, the United States, without the, the governance uh, of the world. And the rest of the world is now catching up. And, and in finding that, gee, you know what, at, at 28 gigahertz, we, we too wanted something. Maybe it's not 28, maybe it's 26. So we can move forward if absolutely necessary, and not even necessary, we're going to move forward um, if the ITU is going to get stuck um, in some spectrum issues. And if they're going to get stuck in spectrum issues, you know, I think that's, that, that's highly uh, indicative of what their capabilities are in some of the other topics and other s subject matter that they want to dabble in. And so I, I have no interest in seeing them get into internet governance issues um, for those functions, given that where we are on the spectrum, uh, spectrum front. Well, let me open up for others on the panel. Do you see... Uh, how do you see U.S. Uh, leadership, U.S. government leadership uh, internationally in the sense that do you see other governments increasingly looking at the, what's going on at the FCC or otherwise the U.S. government to uh, inform their decisions and, uh, and the like on policy issues? 
or do you see it now that uh, they look less and less at the U.S. for these things? Wolfgang, you've got uh, global responsibilities, <laughs> and uh, so particularly see Europe and the like. Well, if I think about um, internet policies, uh, what comes to my mind immediately is net neutrality. And um, um, looking at the regulation in general, I think um, the U.S. has led at least for, for the bigger part of the world uh, um, in the last 25 years, um, the regulatory discussion and the internet governance discussion. Um, what happens in Europe always is um, some rather radical ideas of um, regulation or net neutrality regulation as well. That was the last example um, are taking over. And then the U.S. moves forward, abandons the stuff, and we are regulated in Europe. Yeah, and <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I wonder what the next discussion over here is. I'm getting extremely skeptical about additional regulation coming from the U.S. So. Um, <laughs> On the net neutrality thing, I'm, I'm really pleased to see the development over here, and also, um, not kidding, really, um, if you look at the issue of, for example, zero-rated um, services, I mean, um, two years ago, that was a highly emotional issue. Now, everybody, even in Europe, looks at it uh, and does an in-depth analysis, are there competitive restraints and uh, any harm for consumers or is it not even beneficial for uh, consumers? So we had at least some relief there. Um, but uh, it's right, the U.S. is leading, uh, is still thought leadership in, in terms of any regulation. So Laura, you see the, uh, from a global perspective on, on these things, is what Wolfgang saying true, which is that uh, you see the world sort of look at the U.S., but they may not be able to keep up. So as the U.S. changes its position, whether it's new net neutrality or on other issues, you see that it's uh, that they are they see the echo, but they don't necessarily are are current on these things. I think about India speaking about net neutrality, what's going on there, uh, elsewhere in in Asia and in the Middle East. I, I think it's vital that we not lose our leadership voice in this area. If you look at the history of this, um, it's true that the private sector has led the innovation and the policy developments, but if you read something like the Internet Protocol, the original one, it was called the DOD Internet Protocol. It's important to keep that in mind. It's, um, important to look at the role of the Commerce Department and you know, being a good steward of the domain name system over the years, looking at the role of the State Department, you know, and we could critique any of these, but I think the, the rhetoric around internet freedom uh, from the State Department has been very important. And um, if we don't continue with that voice, then these intermediary uh, countries will swing to where there is a strong message from governments. And you, you see that a little bit with this cyber sovereignty. So in Latin America, for example, some countries are um, jumping on the bandwagon, you know, getting the band back together, as you said, in this area of cyber sovereignty. So um, I, my recommendation is to not lose the leadership and to be in the discussions, whether that's the Internet Governance Forum, whether it's the next Wicket, um, and to even leapfrog ahead and to be a leader in the, you know, the critical areas um, that have already been mentioned, um, cybersecurity, absolutely. Cybersecurity is the great human rights issue of our time. When you think about an outage of the internet no longer being about a loss of communication, but being a loss of life as we move into the material internet. And uh, continued leadership in intellectual property rights enforcement, continued leadership in open innovation. So um, I'm hoping that we don't lose that voice. Will, how do you see that playing out? Has the US been uh, uh, losing its voice, as Laura just said? And uh, if so, how does it recapture that voice? So I mean, I think it's undeniable that people look to what the United States does. Um, and I don't think that's ever gonna change. I think that what, what has changed is that the number of interested parties you know, who wanna participate in these discussions and have a stake in it has dramatically increased. Uh, 
And so I see it less as the, the United States walking away from some of this versus the field is just becoming more crowded. And so I think it's undeniable that given that dynamic, of course, we need to continue to have a steady hand in the United States, both from business, civil society, but the government as well, in pushing for the things that matter. And you know, in addition to things that have been mentioned, um, you know, this is work that across several administrations has continued, things like norms for responsible state behavior online, you know, rules of the road that reduce ambiguity, prevent surprise, things like this, which are important not just from a governmental perspective, but from a global business perspective. It's important that states aren't, you know, as much as possible using our infrastructure to attack one another uh, in a way that is detrimental to other users. Uh, what I do think is uh, important, in addition to the things that have been mentioned already, uh, an area that's ripe for uh, U.S. leadership is uh, questions regarding law enforcement access to data. Uh, so uh, this is a consistent, um, uh, consistent issue for companies like ours that host data around the world. And governments and law enforcement agencies will come to us and say, we need data about our citizen, you know, who's your user, provided to us. And under US law, we're actually prohibited from providing uh, content information responsive to these requests uh, without going through a fairly long and arduous process at DOJ called MLAT. And so one of the things we've been pushing for, in addition to all the things that have men been mentioned already with the FCC and state and commerce, all of which I think are critical and important, is uh, leadership from DOJ on some of these issues. Uh, we recently put out a white paper talking about some of the elements that we think a, a reform would look like. But the risk here is something that Professor Nardis was talking about and, and Wolfgang spoke about and others, which is in the absence of reform on this, there'll be increased pressure for data localization. And what we will see, and my worry, is that some of the unresolved questions over uh, content layer stuff are going to bleed into uh, governmental interest in regulating things at the technical or infrastructure level, which will be very difficult to undo. And so I think, and that's, that's something where US and other democratic countries have uh, vested an important interest in being, being loud voices for. Well, along those lines, you know, China is the largest internet uh, community, largest internet country in the world. Um, I think a lot of people look around the world and see China as a success in many regards, getting their people online, uh, e-commerce booming in China and the like. Uh, the Chinese now are restricting VPNs and a whole series of other things. Um, it seems that there is a, this, this is a non-trivial matter as to where the global leadership is uh, and how it's expressed. Uh, panelists, how does this play out? How do the fundamental uh, issues and perspectives that the US and I think Europe have maintained for many years on the internet uh, reestablish its primacy over these more authoritarian and very successful in certain, by certain criteria, uh, approaches. Commissioner O'Reilly, I saw you shaking your head vigorously. Well, I, it, was only, <laughs> it was only to the point, you know, uh, in terms of what, what you, the, the conversation in terms of what governments may do, because that's, China already does these things, uh, and companies, U.S. companies have already acquiesced in many instances to their, their structure, and that's extremely problematic. But the only thing I would take to the point, uh, it was, uh, you know, you said China is a success, and I want to be, you know, China is not a success if you believe in, you know, liberty um, or freedom, but in terms of, you know, able to, you know, market control and, 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 and designate how things are going to work, you know, as a whole, they may, they may be, but their totalitarian approach to, to internet policy, they, they have taken an approach that, you know, that, that the U.S. hasn't, and that is that being engaged uh, and being in the leadership is critical in these international organizations. And you're starting to see that, not, that they're already in the leadership of those internet, uh, the, the international uh, organizations, and they're moving that to the standard setting bodies. They're saying, you know what, if, if these things, whether they're containment uh, in, in these organizations or whether they're actually pushing an agenda, they're, they're gonna branch out and, and they're gonna see the growth of this and you're gonna see, so 
I think that's extremely problematic, and, and it's our role as a, as, a, as a world leader to counter this a, 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 and use all of our tools. Now, those aren't necessarily all the functions of the FCC, but we can play a role in, in as part of the government um, in, in facilitating some of those things. So, extremely, the, the only thing that the, to my, my panelists have talked about, we talked about the role of government, and, and the truth of the matter is, the government is already, you know, world governments are already incredibly involved um, in internet governance today. And you look at China, Russia, and, you know, name the, 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 the troubling country. Uh, we talked about Egypt and what, what, what they have done. And so that's the fight we're having, and, and the United States ha has an important role to play, and I, 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 I hope that we will, will step up to the role. I'm not sure we did as, as well as we could have in the last administration on this issue. Before I go to questions from the audience, which we'll do in just a moment, any other comments along those lines? I would note that China has been very explicit as to some of the areas in which they seek uh, to, my word, dominate, but I think it's one that they would accept uh, in the world, including artificial intelligence and the like. Uh, so they're looking ahead. Uh, any f other comments along those lines? Laura? Yeah, just one quick follow-up point. I think that there's cultural leadership also, and it's very difficult to change what a sovereign government does, like change with the way that China is approaching it. There are ways of, of working in the technical institutions, ways it's whack-a-mole with the technology, like having circumvention technologies that route around what they're doing. But I think one thing that the US government can do is to not fall into some of the authoritarian and repressive approaches that China has, just to state the obvious. So not going to um, a content intermediary, for example, and saying, we want to see who viewed information on your site. When you have something like that, that the media is uh, circulating, and you know, whether it's happening or not, I, I think that that erodes our moral position in the um, you know, free and open internet space. And so that's one thing that we can do culturally and um, policy-wise. Very good. Let me open up for questions from the audience. I see Richard. Shockingly, Richard has a question. Well, <laughs> what do you expect? Yeah, Richard Bennett, High Tech Forum. Um, Will, can I put you on the spot? Uh, when the, uh, the uh, recent <laughs> FCC reclassified uh, broadband internet access service as a common carrier, there were rumors in the press that Google at the last minute was sort of against that Title II reclassification because of <clears throat> the obvious implications I suppose it has for international approaches to internet governance. It kind of legitimizes the wicked land grab. So um, without putting you on the spot too much, uh, what can you tell us about the potential implications on a global basis of a leading internet nation like the United States deciding that the internet is basically a common carrier system? And what does that have to do with sender pays uh, kind of regimes and uh, essentially regulations on service and content providers that are similar to those that are imposed on internet service providers. Right. So I will caveat by saying I was not involved in any of those discussions. The domestic stuff is not, is not a world that I uh, live in. So, uh, while I'm happy to refer you to folks in my office that might be able to get you a better answer to that, I'm probably not that person. Uh, what I will say is that uh, at an international level, it, it goes back to this fundamental question that we've been wrestling with here. What is, you know, beyond the, uh, uh, the sort of telecommunications network level of the internet? What is the proper and appropriate role of government in setting regulations and standards for things that go to content and intermediaries and platforms and other things like that? And our view is, again, that uh, this is not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges, and that uh, light touch, common sense things are the best way forward. But again, I can't comment on your particular question because I just don't know. Let me ask Mike, who's 
or so. I was going to try and go the whole conference and not talk about this particular uh, <laughs> issue you raise. Uh, but, but I do want to jump in because it was something that was very evident when, when I travel internationally, and it, Wolfgang brought, brings up as well, that you know, they, uh, inter other countries don't, aren't as sophisticated to separate. Well, they are sophisticated, but they, are, they, they may not separate the discussion in terms of when the United States is willing to regulate one part of the economy but not the other part uh, of the internet uh, you know, ecosystem. Um, they, 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 they're, 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 their, uh, their mindset doesn't necessarily um, equate to that, and you see some of that debate happening in Europe and, and other places. So you know, I think it's problematic when we're trying to sell internationally you know, a message of, and I, I've talked about this a number of times, we're trying to sell internationally a message of hands off the internet in general, trying to keep you know, policy, and yet we are doing things in the United States that are harmful. It so completely undercut a number of meetings that I've been part of, and they, they look right to you, it, it, it's, it, you know, and say, well, what about this? And now look at what we've done to Europe in terms of net neutrality. Um, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and I was in Barcelona. We we you know the the, the struggles in February talking about this exact topic, and they had just finished some of these things, and they they just were you know sweating from having to gone through some of that the, the mess that we had kind of set the stage for. So it's incredibly you know I, I think we'll highlight to you know it's like well that's not I, I don't do the domestic side, and it's kind of like uh, two houses kind of kind of talk amongst each other. Um, because the, the, the messages are, are heard internationally and they, they, they don't uh, equate. Commissioner, if I could ask an unfair, another unfair question, which is as you work uh, and as your colleagues work on the next uh, net neutrality, internet freedom, uh, open internet uh, decision, will international be part of that discussion as you think about it and you talk to your colleagues about the international ramifications of what otherwise might be viewed as a domestic issue? Well, that, that's an ongoing proceeding, and we'll just see how that process plays out. Okay. All right. Mike, try to do better than I did. <laughs> oh, um, I'm going to do some combination of playing devil, devil's advocate and maybe attacking a straw man. But um, it seems to me this hands off the internet argument is both, I guess, is naive and I think probably. I'm really going to go over the devil, more the devil than the advocate, um, intellectually bankrupt. I mean, we've spent a lot of the time in this conference, and we all agree that the internet is unbelievably important, that it's the main vehicle for speech and political discourse and everything else. And so the notion to say to sovereign governments, oh, it's the internet, um, that's different, you should leave it alone, I think makes no sense at all. Now, I, have, I, I want to be absolutely clear, even in my role as the devil, I'm not going to advocate in favor of what China and Russia and, and some other countries do. But it seems to me to say to those countries that, oh, it's the internet, that makes it special. There's just no point in saying that because, I mean, why should they listen to that? So if it happens to be a particular communications medium, so that one they should allow free speech even if they don't allow in other things. So it seems to me that what that suggests though, because we, I, am quite in favor of arguing against the policies they have, is we need to move beyond this thing of saying, oh, it's the internet, leave it to engineers, and really focus on promoting in these international bodies and elsewhere the specific policies. And you know, also, I would just like to say, I think there's this danger of sort of myth, some sort of mythology or something that the internet governance system, which Professor Denard has pointed out, there is a governance system, we privatize it, that it works so well. And that somehow these companies always have the right interest. And if nothing else, look at net neutrality, because there are lots of companies on both sides of it. So at least half of them were wrong. Um, and I think if you look at ICANN and what they've done with the top level domain names, I don't think there's any basis for thinking that that was somehow a bunch of self-interested engineers just trying to do the right thing. I think there's a much better model that says it was some very self-interested people thinking about what was best for their particular either private organizations or their governance organization and what would maximize their revenues. So it seems to me that these are really important issues, but that we should move beyond this sort of demonization of government, governments and this idealization of, or idolization of the private sector, and really we need to focus sort of issue by issue, and I think recognize that governments are going to be involved because this stuff is really important. And they were elected, unlike, you know, people at ICANN, for example. And one last thing, just swing it all back, lest you think I've become too pro-government. 
I mean, the big arguments usually, I think, at least by economists and sort of the political economy against government is it's, you know, the power of coercion and the fact that it has monopoly power. But the sort of stuff we're talking about with internet governance, it's not that there are a whole bunch of competing private sector firms offering different models of governance. I mean, there is a collective monopoly there, too. So I think all the problems one associates with government, there's no reason to think that the internet governance institutions avoid any of those. And so it's not the usual thing of unfettered free markets with lots of competition versus a monopolistic government. It's really just different models of governance with lots of um, power in all of them. So that's my rant for the morning. Right. Laura? I can answer that really, really well at sea level. And we're at 8,000 feet. But I think um, what, you're, what you're hitting at is that there are a constellation of issues, right? So that's why we have to say internet governance is not one thing. There are many, many different issues and many layers of governance. So if you look at the content layer, governments already are highly regulate that area. So intellectual property rights, government completely involved. When, when you have identity theft that is perpetrated against you, you want the government to step in and help. Um, you know, threats of violence, child pornography, um, sale of illegal arms, sale of illegal drugs, sale of uh, you know, human trafficking, all of these things have a very um, broad and deep layer of regulation. Moving outside of the US, it goes even further beyond that, where in a place like Thailand, if you insult a monarch online, um, you know, you can be put in jail. If you do other kinds of certain things, the issues that exist in the offline world exist in the online world, and there's very strong uh, regulation. But when you start looking at the layers beneath that, like the logical layer, um, even that has government involvement through in ICANN, the Governmental Advisory Committee, through uh, trademark laws about who gets to have dot .amazon, for example, right? So there, there's a whole layer of that. It's the layer beneath that the, the technical standard setting, open standards that have um, you know, minimal intellectual property rights that anyone can inspect, use, and, and compete with, the domain name system, the new kinds of innovations in the Internet of Things space. So what I would say is the answer to that is that um, you're right, governments are already involved. But if you look at the rapid innovation of the Internet, it has primarily come from the private sector and from these institutions in which um, multiple actors come together, but um, you know, really the private sector has led the innovation. And where governments have stepped in, it has often slowed it down. Any other comments, last comments, before we're at about our appointed time, if we have time for any other final points? Will? Just very quickly, to piggyback on what um, uh, Professor Nardis was saying, I don't think anyone's arguing that governments should have no role in this, right? You know, whether it's ICANN or content layer stuff, governments are involved and should, you know, uh, appropriately be involved, right? They're, as you say, they are elected officials and are allowed to make policies governing the people who elected them. I think for us, one of the questions is, in addition to the logical technical layer questions uh, that were just mentioned, is he, to what extent are governments in a position now? given the global interoperable nature of the internet to start making the rules for other people who didn't elect them. Uh, and you know, does country X get to decide what country Y gets to do online or experience online? And that to us is, is clearly no, they shouldn't. Um, but again, I think that's, that's a source of active debate now. But you know, for us, governments will regulate and we will talk about the appropriateness of those regulations as we do with any government considering to regulate things. But for us, one of the real dangers is, again, extending that extraterritorial application of jurisdiction. Yes, Commissioner? Oh, I, I would just say that uh, there's probably some principles from the trade world that could apply to the internet governance world in the sense that in trade, governments are very involved in consumer protection or security and so forth. There is a role for government. But it's also balanced by general principles on non-discrimination, least trade restrictive solution to a particular policy problem. Um, and it gives you a little bit uh, more of a skill in balancing some of this, uh, these concepts. It's not all one or all the other. Um, and we probably, the two worlds could probably learn a lot from each other. <laughs>
Very good. Well, uh, we could go on all afternoon. I'm told that's not appropriate, so we will not do that. Uh, but instead, we'll thank this extraordinary panel. Thank you very much.